got a, a how many of you guys believe for miracles? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So do you believe that I can preach this message in about 20 minutes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that, there's your miracle starting off today. If you get that one, um, then we will we'll be we'll be just in revival right now. All right. Uh, open up the two passages, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. You can just go there. And we'll, uh, I'll walk you through it in just a minute, but we're talking about living in the presence of God. And last week we talked about the presence of God in three ways that his presence is known. His omnipresence, which is uh, God is everywhere at all times, everywhere, like period. He's just there. There's nowhere that he is not. You can't escape from him. That's his omnipresence. We talked a little bit. We mentioned about his inner presence. That means when you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you. You carry the presence of God in that, in that sense. So the scripture, Jesus said, you know, you knew the, you know of the Holy Spirit. He's been with you, but he will be in you. And so we have the presence of God within us. But then there's this third aspect called the manifest presence, or it's when God makes his presence known in our life. And so we're not always experiencing the manifest presence. We talked about how you can actually leave the manifest presence of God, though you haven't escaped the omnipresence, but like you are not in the presence of the Lord in that sense of he's revealing, making known, making himself understood. There are people who are living uh, maybe even right next to, you know, you, you're in the presence, manifest presence of the Lord, you're experiencing hearing from him, and someone next to you may not be. And that's, that's a reality, but you can also come back into the presence of God. And we talked about that a couple ways that the scripture tells us that we enter into the presence of the Lord through singing, through rejoicing, through with thanksgiving. So if you're wondering, how do I experience the actual presence of God in my life? Then go back to last week's message. It's on YouTube. But you can also read the Bible and just do what it says and begin to lift up your voice and show, you know, give, give thanks to God and sing. And the scripture says you will enter into his presence that way. I want to continue talking about uh, his presence today. I want to talk about his instruments. And so we're going to answer three questions. First question we're going to answer right here is we're uh, talking about Satan. You're like, why? I thought we were talking about the presence of God. Well, we will. But let's talk a little bit about Satan. Why did Satan fall? Why is Satan the bad guy there and he would, he is not in God's presence? Why did Satan fall? Your answer to that probably is, is pride. And I think it's very true and very clear that pride was in the heart of Satan. But I'll tell you this, when you read through the scripture and you get an indication, it's what pride led to is worship, a desire to be worshiped. And so in Isaiah chapter 14, I want to look at this passage with you because it starts to show us a little bit more behind the scenes of who he is and what he did and why he's in the situation he's in. And so in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, this is what it says about it. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Now listen to these next few verses, and you'll hear what are called the I will statements. There's five of them right here. Verse 13, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. So when we're talking about worship, we're talking about Satan. We're seeing in his heart, he's saying, I want something. There is that pride. But what he wants is to be lifted up or come to a higher place. And you'll see it in his speech here. You'll see that. What does he want? He wants to be at the top where he is worshipped. So he says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. This is something that Satan is saying, man, I want to raise up to the top, and I want everybody to be looking at me. I want their adoration. I want their praise. I want their honor. I want their respect. I want to be center stage. I want to ascend to the highest place. I want to be the most high. In his heart, he wanted worship there. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshiped. Everything that he wanted had to do with being lifted up and exalted. Now, pride snuck into his heart, 
and got him into that position to where he's looking at it and seeing what God is getting. And he said, I want that for myself, not with him, but instead of him. I want it. I want it. So why did Satan fall? Well, there is this aspect of him wanting worship. Now, we know this, that in creation, Adam and Eve, first man and woman, they're like the original sinners, we think. And so we hear this term, hey, we are born with an Adamic nature, that, that nature of man. And that is true, but actually Adam and Eve weren't the original sinners. It was Satan. And the reality is we're not just born with an Adamic nature, because sometimes you'll hear people say we're all children of God. Well, actually, <laughs> the scripture kind of indicates that we're born with a satanic nature. Now, that's not good news. No one's here sitting, sitting here thinking, wow, that's what I wanted to hear, Pastor. Thanks for <laughs> saying that I have a satanic nature. No, mankind is born this way in that sense of we want to be at the top. We want to be the best. We want to look good. We want to be liked. We want to be wanted. We want all eyes on us. There's just something in our nature about that that looks to ourselves as opposed to to looking to God. And it starts at an early age. Some of you may not believe me. Think about this. I'll give you a little simple example. Group picture. Who's the first person you look for? I'm just saying. You're looking to you, right? Like, where am I at? Okay, everybody else. And then, hey, let's share this photo. Wait, no, no, not that photo. That's a bad photo because I have something in my teeth or whatever. You know, there's something in our nature that says we, we want to be tough the top. We want to look good. We want we want the affection and, and acceptance and adoration and, and all of these things. And that might not be the best carryover equivalent example, but there is something that's passed down in this rebellion to where we put ourselves above God. Well, it didn't start with us. It didn't start with Adam and Eve. It started even with Satan prior to that. In Revelation, uh, our, we'll turn to Revelation in just a minute. Um, but think about this. Jesus Here's the difference between Jesus and Satan. Jesus always takes the spotlight off himself when he's talking, and he puts it on the Father. People were saying, wow, those are good words. He says, but I, I don't say anything except what I hear my Father saying. Oh, the things you did are amazing, Jesus. Yeah, but I don't do anything except for what I see the Father doing. So there's a humility and a direction of, hey, don't put, don't even just put it on me. Now, we put our affection on Jesus, and we can, we can do that, and that's fine. But he's modeling something as the son of man, he's, as God in the flesh. He's modeling something of, of hey, we got to look to God. We got to be a people who, who honor God, look to God, respect God, follow him, and, and uh, give our worship to him. This is what we do. Now, Satan has no new tricks. He's always up to the same thing. From the very beginning when we see him revealed, we see that he is uh, trying to get worship for himself. Actually, Isaiah is the beginning because it's going back before Genesis right here. But then even in Revelation, you see he's doing the same old thing. In chapter 13, it says this. So they worshiped the dragon. And if you were to look at, I think, chapter 14, it says the dragon is, is, is Satan. That, that serpent of old it says, so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? So in the end times, we see God showing us that Satan is still trying to get worship and people are worshiping him. And then when those words are used, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? That is a ripoff of Old Testament scripture of worship that goes to God, who is like our God, who is like unto our God. And so through the Psalms, you see that phrase used about God. But in Revelation, Satan has turned it to make it about him. He's always after worship. He loves to be worshiped. In Matthew chapter eight, verse, or chapter four, eight and nine, he even tried to get Jesus to worship him. It says this, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the, have, the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. So he's so focused on getting worship to the point where it's not enough to be worshiped by other fallen angels or maybe other people. But he's even wanting God himself to worship Satan, he work, worship him. And I want to highlight something here too. He doesn't just say, if you will worship me, but he says, if you will fall down and worship me. See, that's important because worship is always expressed. 
Worship is always expressed. We want to keep this in, in, in mind. Worship isn't just, I'm worshiping God in my heart right now. Now, it, you may have some stuff in your heart that you're worshiping God about, but true worship is always expressed. There is the, the clapping of the hands, the singing of the psalms, the lifting of the hands, the bowing down. We worship God, you know, you, you twirl around. You worship God when you, when you dance. You can worship and, and express that by laying prostrate. You don't worship God by twerking. Okay, just in case anyone's wondering. Like, there's certain things, that's not worship. We can worship God and dance, but we don't worship God by twerking. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's expressed. Worship is expressed. Even our giving, when we give and, and we bring our tithe to the Lord or, or an offering, that's expressing worship. God, I'm looking to you. All of those are expressions of, of worship. They're actions of worship. So, yeah, it starts from the heart, but it doesn't stay there. It doesn't stay there. The rest of your body needs to know what's going on in your heart and in your mind. And this is really important, too, because people are, are following your example of worship. Fathers, especially men. There's something powerful when men worship. Now, it's powerful for all of us, but when men worship and we're lifting up our voices and our kids see us worship and they see how we model before them that we are surrendered to God and we love God and we cry out to him and we lift up our voices and we sing even if we don't have a great voice like Pastor Daniel. No, I mean, I don't have a great voice. I wasn't saying I have a great voice. So you guys laugh like, oh, he doesn't have a great voice. You're right. <laughs> but there's something significant about modeling before others how we worship and express ourselves before the Lord and your kids are watching and new people who come in who have not experienced the presence of the Lord they watch how we respond as a church are we engaged and we're we singing are we are we clapping our hands on beat are we are we lifting up our voice are we praying are, are we closing our eyes just to focus in them on at the same time and I know some people say well that's not how I worship and all this I, I know that's not Maybe how everybody worships the same way, but you need to express it. So, so stop saying what you like to do. God, what does your word say about how we worship? And then just start there and say, okay, I'm going to take the next step. You know, I'll be like this, raising my hands, be like this, be like this, 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 you know. The next thing you know, be like Richard Simmons. Um, I always say that for the older people here. The rest of the people are like, who is that? Okay. So we, we're expressing our, we express our worship. Okay, so this is why Satan fell, is because he wanted to be worshipped. Now, I want to go a little bit further, talking about worship, and, and we were led by this team today, and thank you guys so much for leading us well into the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Love having you, having you with us here. Um, but instruments, you know, sometimes people think, oh, we shouldn't have instruments, we don't worship or what, it, with instruments, because... For whatever reason, I don't know. But let's talk about this. Who created instruments? Who created instruments? Um, Isaiah chapter 14, when God is addressing Satan through this prophetic passage, and we'll also look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Both of these are prophecies that speak to kings. But oftentimes in the scripture, you'll see a word that is spoken to a man, but it's also addressing the spirit behind the man, or that would be motivating or on the spiritual uh, dynamic. In fact, we know a very popular time when this happened, popular may, might not, well known would be a better uh, saying passage, when say, Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. But he's looking at Peter, but he's talking to Satan. He said, you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man, because Peter was trying to tell him, don't, you don't have to go to the cross. And Jesus recognized that's not just Peter's good idea. But that is satanically inspired behind the, behind what he said. It's satanically motivated. And so he addressed the spirit behind what was being said. So in these passages, Isaiah and Ezekiel, where we'll get to in a moment, we're going to see that God is addressing a king, but he's also addressing the spirit. And we get an understanding about Lucifer, Satan, through these passages, because that's who it's addressing in the spirit. So in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 11, your pomp is brought down to Sheol, oftentimes translated hell in some versions, and the sound of your stringed instruments. 
wait a minute, he's, he's rebuking him, he's saying you're not going to be lifted up, you're going to be brought down, you and your instruments are going to be brought down to hell. Satan, by the way, did not create instruments, Satan himself is a created being, and he was created with stringed instrument, instruments. Um, look at Isaiah or Ezekiel chapter 28, and I just want you to catch a couple things, because it'll all make... Uh, it'll all come together in a moment. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 through 16. Another one of these prophecies against the king, but the spirit behind them. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, wait a minute. Who else? Who was in Eden, the Garden of God, when we read Genesis? We see God, we see Adam, we see Eve, and we see the serpent, Satan, right? And so this helps you to understand who he's talking to. He's actually saying, you were there back then, which is a whole lot, uh, a whole long time ago <laughs> prior to this passage. And so he's, he's speaking to the spirit behind, and he says, every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. So there was a beauty that he possessed. Glorious. If you saw him. He says, look at this. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. Not born created this angel Lucifer was created and the scripture says your timbrels and your pipes so we already know he's being brought down with stringed instruments timbrels what's a what's a word that we would similar to that in the instrument world here that we would think of timbrels sounds like tambourines right something that is percussion your timbrels and your pipes, your wind instruments. So we have the whole family of instruments represented in him, created in him. Strings, percussion, and wind. And that basically describes the family of instruments that we still use today. And all of those were found in Satan. This is why uh, people would say Satan was the worship leader in heaven. So he didn't just decide he wanted worship because worship sounded like a good idea. He was deeply engaged in the process of worshiping in heaven. And he fell in love with the act of worship and wanted to become the object of worship. And he had all the parts, the gifts, the skills, and the abilities, and yet he thought they were for him. Sometimes we follow into that same pattern and look at our skills, our gifts, and our abilities, and we think they're for us. But they're actually created in us for the Lord. So what are you good at? What are you gifted at? What are you skilled at? That is something that God has put on the inside of you for Him, for His glory. Amen? So you, the timbrels and pipes, they were prepared for you on the day you were created. I'm going to get back to those instruments. You were the anointed cherub who covers. The anointed cherub, what's a cherub? It's like an angel. I established you, uh, I established you, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the days you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, now this is an important verse, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. So the scripture is telling us right here that Satan, when you think about, oh, why was Satan, why is he not in heaven anymore? And why is he not in that place where it says, by the abundance of your um, your trading, or in some of your versions, like Old King James, I would say merchandising. What does that word mean? What was Satan doing? It's like this, he's merchandising, or the abundance of his trading. This word isn't just like, hey, he was good at business, but it actually means that he was sneaky at <laughs> business. It's, it's like this, um, 
I own a business here, and Cherise works for me, and she sells the shoes in my shoe business because I like shoes, and she's a great salesperson. And she's like, those shoes right there, oh, you'll love these shoes. She's selling the shoes, and those shoes are $200. And that's what the price really is. And so they pay her the $200, she puts $100 in the cash register, and $100 in her pocket. What's happening? She's taking what belongs to me and making it her own. She's taking of the, the income, the profit that belongs to the owner and for herself with that which isn't, hasn't been given to her. Sure, she would never do that, of course, right? Right? Okay, one more convincing, right? If I start a shoe business. But this is what Satan was doing. His job was to bring worship to God, but he was starting to skim off the top. He was wanting to take it for himself. And once he, that even came into his heart, he began uh, to you know, be, think, oh, I'm gonna raise up, I'm gonna raise up, I'm gonna get all this worship for myself. And, and God says, no, no, I brought you down. I cut you out just like this. Knock, knocked you down right away. Um, I cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God. You're cast away from the presence of God. That right there was a major cosmic violation that Satan committed. Now, by the way, when we think about Satan, you think, okay, well, he had a significant role. The Bible actually identifies three different angels. We call them archangels in the scripture, and they all play significant roles. They're like the chief of these things. And so we have uh, Michael. Michael is the archangel. He's the one that rules over prayer. We see him showing up when Daniel is praying and, and in the midst of spiritual warfare. Daniel, Michael uh, he shows up and he says, hey, I heard, God, I heard your prayer and I've been doing battle on your behalf. It's just taking me a little while, but uh, I'm the one that's responding to prayer. There's also Gabriel. Gabriel is the one who rules over the word. He's the messenger angel. He's the one that shows up with a message from the Lord for people. We see, you know, Joseph, we see it with Mary. He is the ruler of the word. So the angel that would administrate those things. And then you have Lucifer, who is the ruler of worship, who, who was the leader of worship. So we have those three aspects, which are really the three pillars of the church. Worship, the word, and prayer. All three of them have an assigned spiritual uh, leader, administrator within the heavens that God has placed. And Lucifer was the one who oversaw worship. These are the three pillars of the church and your life as well. You want to make sure that you give them all a place in your life. Now, back to Ezekiel chapter 28. He said, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So Satan was created with the timbrels and the pipes. And then Isaiah said the strings as well. His greatest desire is to be worshiped. Let me just say this though. You were created with timbrels, pipes, and strings. You were created with that. Did you realize that? You think about the timbrels, percussion. Here's your instruments right here. Or like these guys used to walk around rapping in high school. Yeah, I don't know what they're saying. Hey, diddle, diddle. No, I'm just kidding. Um, percussion. You've got the strings. It's your vocal cords. You've got the, the wind. We've got a lot of wind instruments around here. But we're talking about wind right here, blowing over those vocal cords. You know, ah! You singing like that? I know that's pretty good. Huh? Yeah. That's why I'm not on the worship team. But you have the ability to sing. All of those are instruments that God has given you to express worship to him. Instruments are important. Plus, we have the ability to use physical instruments that we're, we're, we create and we use those to worship God. Let's look at some of those scriptures. First Chronicles 13, 8. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. First Chronicles 25, 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, and of Juduthun, who should prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. He taught his worship team to prophesy with their instruments. When they would play, they were playing prophetically. This isn't just, wow, you're really good, but man, God is showing up 
in the midst of this his presence is being manifest even to the point of the next verse our next passage second chronicles 5 13 and 14. indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one everybody say as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and they praised the Lord saying, let's actually say this out loud from the screen. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let's say it one more time. For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled that house. When did it fill the house? When the voices were lifted up and the instruments were being played and we were all together as one worshiping God. Amen. The presence of God was made manifest. Amen. Now, there are times in our lives when, man, I don't know what's going on, but I came into this place of worship and my heart is just broken. I want to repent of my sin. I want to run to Jesus and be loved. I want to tell other people about what God has done in my life. There's something powerful about a church when we worship God wholeheartedly with our voices and with instruments. And we're not doing it for the show, but we're doing it for the Savior. There's something powerful about that. And people who don't know Christ could come in and think, man, that music is pretty good over there. Like, I really felt something. They don't always understand what it is, but they just got bumped into by God in the midst of our worship. The whole house was filled with the presence, the glory of God. So much so the priests couldn't even do their job. I would gladly sit it out to sit in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Last question here. What did God do? So what did God do? What did God do about Satan? What did he do about this whole situation? So Satan is cast down to earth. Jesus said, and Luke, I saw him fall to earth like lightning from heaven. That's how fast it was. As soon as this came into his heart, God said, nope, not up here. <laughs> and he cast them down. In Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you have, of course, the creation account. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, verse 1. But then in verse 2, it's this little passage that kind of, it's like, how do, how do we understand this in light of verse 3, which is then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and it goes on to the um, creation account. Verse 2 follows, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And most theologians look at this verse and they say, you know, they, they're trying to reconcile how, how do we understand this? And there's a lot of different theories of, of what happened there. But what many believe is this is pointing out to the period when Satan fell. So God had created heaven and earth before the mankind was all created. So there is this period before that, and then we don't know how long it is. The Bible doesn't seem to think that's important for us to know or for us to speculate on even. We can guess, but, but when Satan was, wanted worship, God struck him down, cast him out of heaven onto this earth, and when he arrived, it says, and darkness. Darkness, is the, the Hebrew word is chaos there. I'm sorry, the with, without form and void. The without form is, speaks of chaos. So when Satan was struck down to earth, it brought chaos to what was created there. And it was um, empty. There was emptiness on it. It was void. It was empty. And darkness had covered the earth. And so we see this here. Um, that's when you know many believe that this is when God sent Satan to earth. But then God starts to address that situation. In the very next verse, he says, let there be light. What's he do? He expels the darkness by bringing his word and bringing light. And then he says, let's bring some form here. Let the earth produce. Let there be, you know, sun and moon and stars and, and some order to some things. What does he do? He gets rid of the chaos. He addresses the chaos. And then he says, and let's fill this place. You know, be fruitful and multiply and, and let the, you know, Fish come and animals, they continue to produce. And you, Adam, Eve, you produce here. Let's fill this place up. Brings fullness to the emptiness. 
But Satan is still on earth. That's where he was sent. Satan, the one who was the worship leader who wanted to be worshipped, who got struck down. And he looks at all this creation and, and how God started to turn things around from what he destroyed there on, on, on earth. And you can only, you can, you can just about imagine Satan saying, oh, yeah, that's all fine and beautiful. And you got your word that came to pass and you're, you're putting this order and you're setting things right. But who's going to worship you? Who's going to lead worship now? Now that I'm gone, who's going to be the worship leader now? And God looks at him and reaches down and grabs a handful of dirt and breathes into it and says, there they are, Adam and Eve. They're my new worship leaders, created with timbrels and pipes and percussion. And they're going to multiply, and I'm not just going to have one worship leader. I'm going to fill this earth with worship leaders, with worshipers that are continuously declaring the praise and the glory of God, who have the capacity to direct that worship up to him. But here's the problem. Satan looked at that as his opportunity, and he shows up next to the new worship leaders, and in the garden, he says, eat of this fruit. Oh, we can't eat of that fruit. He said, don't, don't eat it, don't even touch it. He says, oh, you can eat it, because when you eat it, you're gonna be like God. So he plants a seed in their heart that he had in his, that I wanna be like the Most High. And here's Adam and Eve suddenly thinking, the Most High is amazing. I love the Most High. And I can be like him? I can be amazing too? The wild thing is, is that God already said that they're like him. But in their heart, there is this, I'm gonna, Take the place of. And so he got them to buy into his lie that they're going to be like the Most High. And what happened? Adam and Eve bring chaos and darkness right back, right back into the world. God, though, had some other things to say. <laughs> he looks at them and says, All right. Pronounces the judgments that are going to come. He says, there's going to be a time. <laughs> there's going to be a time when I am going to send the light of the world once again and expel this darkness. And that's what we see when Jesus came, that he was sent to expel the darkness once again, and not to keep us out like Lucifer himself was forever, forever out. No opportunity for restoration or redemption. But he sent his son, God sends his son, to redeem us, to come back to him. That we can experience the fullness of God in our lives. And that eventually we'll get back to that place where oh, we're with him face to face. There's no stuff that gets mixed up in the flesh and sin on earth that keeps us from the Lord. He's, he's dealt with that on the cross. But he'll deal with that when we, like, ultimately, the flesh doing away with this, giving us a new nature, a new, a new body, as we worship him, stand face to face before the Lord in heaven. This is how God created us. Let there be light, so he sends his son into the world. Now with that, he's restoring his instruments of worship, which is you and me. This is how we experience the presence of the Lord, when we use the instruments that God has given us to worship him, to glorify him, to magnify him, and make it all about him. When we do that, that's how we see the house filled with the presence of the Lord, just like we read in 2 Chronicles there. I want you to think about that this morning as we, we pray, and um, we went a little over time. So that I, am, I am going to, it's okay? Thank you. Yeah. It's okay? Thanks. <laughs> but I want us to pray and respond to the Lord right now. And then we will take time to have our discussion and if, I understand if you have to go you have the pot roast in the oven whatever it is got to beat the Baptist to the buffet but let's pray and respond to the Lord right now and I want you to bow your head and just think uh, uh, about what you've heard if worship is such a priority in the scripture it's one of the main pillars that the church is built on what kind of priority is it in your life 
how important is it to, for you to, to be part of the body to worship and to worship on your own? And maybe even thinking about that and, and thinking before the Lord, talking to, to God about how, how you can use who you are and, and what he's put on the inside of you to worship him. And just even say that, God, I want to worship you with all my heart. Lord, I want to learn to, to sing and to, to express worship to you in a way that welcomes your presence. Lord God, we want to be a people who, who experienced the fullness of God personally and, and together. And Lord, if there's anybody here who just throughout this time is, uh, kind of hear you knocking on their heart's door and saying, uh, open up, I want to come in. Lord, I pray their hearts would be open, that they would simply just say, God, I'm inviting you into my life. And then maybe if that's you and you need to um, restart your relationship with Jesus, do that right now. Or start a relationship. Say, Jesus, I trust you. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I'm giving myself over to you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Do you receive something from God there? You see about the importance of worship? We're going somewhere as a church. And this is where part of the reason why I'm teaching on this. We're going somewhere in the presence of the Lord in our time of worship. And every week we're seeing, we're stepping deeper and deeper into it. And God is, is showing up. And we're thankful for that. Uh, if you're here and you don't have a home church, I always invite people, give us a year. Watch the word of God change your life. And uh, don't, don't be out there wondering where you should go. You've got people who will love you right here and jump into the word with you and encourage you. So if you need a home church, this is a great one. Um, one thing we do every Sunday after our gathering and we get into the word, we take a few minutes to talk about it. I've got a couple questions on the screen is what I'm going to ask you to do at your table or maybe rearrange your chairs for just about 10 minutes if you can. Uh, walk through some of these questions. You don't have to walk through all of them. Not everyone has to answer them. But let's let's actually take the word that we just heard and not just go off and do our own thing. But let's talk about it for a minute. And uh, and then if you can, you know, close out in prayer with one another, that would be awesome. Amen. Amen. All right. I love you guys. Jump into it. Ten minutes. Let's take ten minutes and we'll have refreshments in the back.